Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Samantha. I'm the Director of Education, and today's webinar topic will be configuring people options. So before we dive right in, let's take care of just a handful of housekeeping items. Give everyone a chance to join us on time. Before we get started, all of your phones and microphones are muted. So if you have any questions, you don't have to keep them to yourself. You can ask us in the chat. My favorite teammate, Devin, is going to be hanging out, ready to answer your questions about configuring people options on your website. So you can enter those in the chat. And of course, we'll have time for some live Q&A at the end of today's session. A recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel within a couple of days. So if you aren't able to make it, you'll have the benefit of that recording. We'll show you how to access that. If you're interested in learning what we have coming down the hopper as far as uh, webinars go, we'll be posting our July schedule and likely our August schedule very soon. So be sure to check back at clubexpress.com slash calendar or just select the calendar from the menu and you can find all of our upcoming webinars there. A benefit to looking for those webinars in the future is that if you register in advance, you have the opportunity to submit something or really anything that you'd like to see us demonstrate as part of that webinar. So if you get us those questions or those things that you just want us to see, uh, want us to go through for you, you go ahead and register for that in advance. And as I mentioned, a recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. So you can access our videos in a handful of different ways from your support tab from our help system, or just by going to youtube.com and searching for clubexpress.com with the .com spelled out. And of course, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you get notified every single time we post a new tutorial or a recorded webinar. So go ahead and make sure you hit that button. And finally, if you are enjoying Club Express or if you have opinions on Club Express, we would love to hear them. If you go to clubexpress.com slash reviews, you can leave a review about Club Express on any one of the sites that you see there. Your reviews, of course, help us learn what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and they're invaluable to potential customers in determining whether or not Club Express is going to be a good fit for them. So if you have a few minutes, we would love for you to leave us a few words. And with all that being said, let's take a brief look at where we're going to be going today. So today's webinar is probably going to be a little shorter than you're used to seeing. We have a very light topic, but there are a lot of implications for the people options that you set up on your site. So this is a setup option and it's part of the setup checklist. So if you have been around long enough that you maybe kind of still remember the setup checklist, it was one of the things that you would have configured initially. And as I like to say, those setup options are usually set it and forget it items. So you may not quite remember what you've set up. You may not even remember what options are available for you to configure. Plus, since the last time we hosted this webinar about four years ago, we've added some new features. So this is going to be a combination of an update and some basic info for you. Your people options are what control your membership options. So this is what's controlling the data that you're collecting from all of your members, your primary members, secondary and tertiary members. If you have group memberships or business memberships, it's controlling a lot of the basic fields and what you're able to see and what your members are able to do as far as managing themselves as well. So this also controls your global selections that you might be making about your contact information requirements and notifications that are being sent to various officers and chapter administrators. Now, I did mention at the very top that this pairs with a webinar that we hosted last week, configuring member types. So you're going to see a lot of the features that we highlighted in member types that are coming up in people options and vice versa. So we do recommend that you take a peek at that if you weren't able to catch our webinar last week. And to dive in today, let's take a little bit of a tour of our agenda, if you will. So we're going to go through our membership options as well as a contact info options for additional members. We'll make our global contact information requirement settings. We'll set up our notifications. And then we'll also talk about organizations who are collecting information, which uh, would be personal organizations, hobby-based organizations versus professional 
associations. So whether you're a local running group or a medical association, uh, we have different ways that you might want to think about the types of information that you're collecting and how it's going to be presented. And then, of course, we'll go through some of the additional options that you would have set up if you're an organization with subgroups. So let's go ahead and dive right in. I'm going to adjust my settings just a little bit. All right, so everyone should be looking at the Northwest Balloon Club. We're actually going to take a look at a couple of different uh, clubs today. Uh, we're going to take a look at the Northwest Balloon Club, which is a club that our fake members join through their personal lives, through the love of ballooning. And then we'll also take a look at our Chicago Association of Financial Planners, which is a professional association. So to get to our people options, I'm signed in as an administrator, Martin Smith, our favorite Northwest Balloon Club administrator, and I'll go ahead and select the control panel. And in the people tab, at the very bottom in the setup section, which is where we spent most of our time last week looking at member types, now we're going to take a look at our people options. So I'll select this. And right away, it's going to look really similar to a lot of the configuration screens that you might be seeing, especially across some of the tabs, the money options screen, uh, website options. You're used to seeing a lot of individual items to configure. The people options page is the, I believe it's the longest, the money options page might be just about the same. So there are a lot of moving pieces here, a lot of things for you to take into consideration. Now, we're going to start at the top and every so often, I'll pop over to a profile or our people manager to kind of show how those changes are affecting what we're collecting and what we see. But I tr I'll try not to do that so much so that we aren't constantly flip-flopping back and forth. So right at the top, one of the things that I mentioned was the difference between information being collected when members are joining through their personal lives or joining through their business or professional lives. Now, if you're an organization that has both, don't worry, we've got you covered. But let's start with members joining through their personal lives. So that would cover, as I mentioned before, hobbyist organizations, uh, local running groups, biking groups, anything athletic, moms groups, local neighborhood groups, HOAs, and things like that. So anytime you're thinking about an organization, you're thinking of whether or not someone would come to it because of their job or come to it because they just really enjoy it. Now, what does that mean for you as an administrator and what you would see and also for your members? This kind of controls one major portion of your data collection, which is work information. Now, you might also know that there is a separate question, can members enter work information on their member profile? And when we're taking a look at both of those, they're going to do the exact same thing. But if you're an organization where members are joining through their personal lives, you won't automatically get the option to collect work information. So you can collect it and make it optional even when your members are only joining through their personal lives. Now, if you select that they are joining through their business or professional lives, that tells the system, I always want to give them the fields for collecting work information. And... Let's take a look at what that looks like in the people manager and in the member profile. So I'll go ahead and revert that selection. And we're going to take a look at Martin Smith's member profile here. Now, Martin Smith is the administrator, but he's also just a regular member. And right now we are having members join through their personal lives and we are still collecting our work information. So if I take a look at Martin's profile and I'll go ahead and leave this because I haven't made any changes. And I take a look at Martin's basic contact information. And we'll scroll down just a bit here. Now, we're going to talk about a lot of this, for example, secondary addresses. But at the bottom here, we can see that I am able to see some additional work information for Martin Smith. Now, if I cancel out of this and I remove work information, I'll no longer see that panel. Now, I'm going to switch tabs here very briefly. And I'm taking a look at our Chicago Association of Financial Planners. And this is an organization where we are automatically collecting work information. And I'll go ahead and visit Martin's member profile and take a look. 
Now, here we have a couple of additional things happening. Martin is actually a business member. So not only are we automatically collecting work information, but we've actually taken that work information out and it's being focused on as a real whole part of the membership. Because if you'll recall from dealing with business memberships, the business is actually the member and the individual people who are part of that membership are really caretakers for the membership. Now, let's go ahead and go back into our people options, and we're going to leave our Northwest Balloon Club as collecting just our personal info. We aren't joining through our work or professional lives, but we'll come back to being able to enter work information, and we're going to take a look at the people manager and see what differences that would make for you as an administrator when you're looking at their info that you've collected. Now, next up, does membership require approval by the board. You'll note that there's a little bit of text there that says it's a default setting only and can be overridden. So really what this button is doing is automatically checking off that memberships do or don't require approval every single time you create a new member type. So if most of your memberships are going to require approval, you can go ahead and check that off, but don't worry, you can always change it on a member type by member type basis. Now, we did talk about membership approvals in our last webinar, and we do have a couple of other items on our YouTube channel that go through the approval process. So we won't go over that just yet. Now, can certain members enter an alternative address to be used at some specific times during the year? So this is really useful more for uh organizations where you're joining through your personal life. So you would think of a secondary address like a snowbird. So someone who lives up north, travels down to Florida for the uh, for the winter, and you would want to make sure that they're getting whatever you happen to be sending out, whether it's a newsletter or any other type of mail to their secondary address, or perhaps you want their proper address to be printed on any invoices that you might send that member. Now, you'll remember that when we were taking a look at Martin's profile, you had a spot for a secondary address, and we will visit Martin's profile a little bit later again, so we can take a look at that too. But another use for an alternative address would be if you have students who are members. Uh, so when you're thinking about students, especially students who might join local organizations, if they're only local because they're going to college in your town, but move back home for part of the year, great use for a secondary address on your organization's uh, profiles. Next up, are we tracking sponsors? So sponsorship is something that you can track through reporting, and there is a specific field within the member profile that allows the member to input some sponsorship information. So if you are tracking it, if it's optional or if it's required, this will be turned on for every single member type um, and every single member profile. So keep in mind, if you are tracking, it's either going to be optional or for everyone or not at all. Next up, if you allow duplicate signups. So what? let me sort of explain what happens in the system when someone signs up if you are avoiding duplicate signups. If you're avoiding duplicate signups, the system automatically runs a check on the name and email address that a potential new member enters into the system. And if the system finds them, they let them know you're already a member, we already have your email address on file, please go ahead and log in. And at that point, the member would be able to either request a new password because they've forgotten their old one, or perhaps they might reach out to you to have you reset their password. But if you are permitting duplicate signups, if you are looking to maybe not necessarily enforce continued membership, um, duplicate signups also help with members who perhaps let their membership lapse for years and then just decide that they want to sign up with a fresh membership instead of continuing their previous membership. So kind of thinking about in lines of what you're enforcing as far as continuous renewal or not, if you want to allow members to be able to sign up with a completely different membership um, in, in the event that they let their membership lapse. You also have then the opportunity to allow multiple people to sign up with the same address if they're part of the same household, but not necessarily part of the same membership.
So there are a lot of items that you'll hear about today and uh, that we've talked about in some of our past webinars that are really just organizational preferences. For most of these, there is not a right or wrong answer. It's simply what your organization wants to collect and what works for you. So moving on, we have primary member gender and pronouns. And these are fields that you can have on your site that allow your members to be able to uh, mark off as a radio button option their gender. And if you would like them to also be able to provide their pronoun choice, you'd be able to give them that option through their member profile. Now, in addition to that, one of the things that we should note and that we'll take a look at towards the end of our time together is that a lot of this information is going to be potentially presented in your membership directory. Now, before we get too deep into the weeds with the membership directory, remember that we are focusing on people options. Just note that in the membership directory, every single organization has the opportunity to give the member full power over what information is shown in the directory. And of course, you have the option to make that particular directory a module that's only visible to logged in members. So when you're looking at the information that you're collecting from your members, addresses, phone numbers, uh, personal information, it's not always something that's going to be public facing. And it is certainly up to you as administrators and website administrators to take a look at what information is available to the public. And especially if you are, you know, putting up some sort of directory listing, making sure that you are protecting your members' privacy. So moving on to capturing your birthdays. Now, birthday is again optional. This is something that might appear on the membership uh, directory, and it's something certainly that gets thrown into the member profile. And next up, some fun info, your member's nickname, which shows up in their profile as well at, and their membership directory listing, as well as their spouse's first and last name. And again, if you're an organization where members are joining through their professional lives, they are likely not going to want to include their spouse's information. Whether or not you want to enable emergency contacts. Um, emergency contacts are a really fun field. We usually include them on all of our member profiles, especially for ballooning,s as there might be some accidents. And what's great about emergency contacts is that when you have group memberships, especially family memberships, and you're adding additional members, you're able to quickly copy all of the emergency contact information from member to member. So if you have family memberships where all of the kids are going to have grandma as the emergency contact, they can copy members can copy that across all of their tertiary members as opposed to having to enter that information multiple times. And you'll also recall that you're able to import some of the information from member profiles into events. So if you aren't sure what we're talking about, go ahead and check back some of our previous webinars when we covered event questions and additional member data questions. So think about for organizations where you might be uh, tackling some activity every so often, if you're collecting emergency contact info in your member profiles and throughout that sign up process and that renewal process, you don't have to ask your members to enter that information in again when you're hosting your next nighttime bike ride. You can simply connect the question that's being asked in the member profile with their registration in the event so that all of their information is automatically stored and you can run a report from the event with all those answered questions and you'd be able to have a printout of everyone's emergency contact information. You wouldn't have to navigate into the people manager on the go. You wouldn't have to worry about any of that. So kind of keep in mind that if you aren't collecting emergency contact information through the member profile, but you do anticipate needing it for events, you can make that connection and ask the question once and never have to ask it again. Next up, we have a couple of options for our organizations with subgroups. So hope that you've taken a minute to join us today. Let's talk about subgroups. At the top here, we have our chapter selection in the member profile. So when a member signs up for an organization, they're typically choosing their chapter and adding in all of their additional members, if they're a family membership or a business membership, right at the start. 
This allows members to make a chapter selection through their member profile if they have, say, moved, or if you're an organization that's using our chapter and subgroup function in a slightly different way. So I'm looking at you, homeowners associations. So a lot of homeowners associations will use our subgroup, excuse me, subgroup functionality to denote miniature clubs within their group or within their village or their subdivision. They might have a group for poker, swimming, running, cycling, gardening, anything that you can think of. So whether or not members are able to either make a chapter selection through their member profile, choosing a Chicago chapter or a Springfield chapter, or even choosing those individual groups that they might belong to. Now, whether or not the member and the administrator can do that, or if you're leaving that to administrators only, or if you're not able to make that selection in the member profile at all. So that, again, just depends on the level of control that you want to have through your duties as an administrator. A lot of administrators like their members to be able to go in and do everything on their own. And some organizations prefer that their administrators handle most of that work. Again, these are options that are entirely up to you, and we can certainly provide some color as to what other organizations have been doing and their best practices, but at the end of the day, it's what works for you. Now, underneath this, are we notifying our chapters on membership change? And again, when I say chapters, I do mean organizations who do have chapters and regions and districts, and organizations who are using that chaptering functionality in a little bit of a different way. Do you want to notify anyone on any changes that are made? So let's address those uh, questions. First of all, who are we notifying? Great question. When you set up your organization data and your organization chart, and I'm going to take a brief break from people options because I'm sure everyone is sick of looking at it at this point. I'm going to pop into our control panel and take a look at our club tab, organization data. Now, when you set up your organization and you're taking a look at all of your chapters, districts, and regions, we took a look at this very briefly last week when we were looking at different fees that you would apply to individual groups. But in addition to being able to edit the membership fees, you can also add administrators to any level that you see here. And when I select add administrator, I see that same very familiar pop-up window where I'm choosing a member from my database. So to answer your first question, it is the chapter, district, or region level administrator who gets notified when someone leaves or joins a specific subgroup. So I'll go back into my people options and revisit exactly what we're talking about. When you're choosing whether or not someone gets notified, you then choose when to notify them. If someone joins, renews, leaves, or if they are an expired or a dropped member. Now, something important to note is that if an administrator makes these changes, so for example, if I, as Martin Smith, make changes to someone's chapter uh, designation, the chapter level administrator won't get notified of that change. But if the member makes their own change, the chapter level administrator will get a notification. Now, next up, are we charging for membership changes made through the profile? So let's talk about what you might actually get charged for through your member profile and what that would look like and why you may not want to do that. So there are a couple of different things that you could be charged for through your member profile, not your renewal fee. Well, your renewal fee is a renewal fee. That's a totally separate fee. And of course, your joining fee would have already been paid. But let's say that there is a fee for joining a specific chapter or group within your organization. And when a member signs up and makes their chapter selection initially, they likely pay all of the fees. But if they're going back into their member profile and making a chapter selection that way, or perhaps going back into their member profile and adding in a badge that they forgot to purchase when they signed up initially, if you choose not to charge members for changes made through their profile, they'd be able to add a chapter, 
add a secondary member and perhaps even add an additional item and they wouldn't be charged for it. They would only get charged for things that they would purchase or add during the sign up or renewal process. So keeping that in mind, you know, again, there aren't a lot of reasons why or why not if you do want to charge for joining every chapter, every time, every group, every time, go ahead and make sure that you do charge for those uh, changes made through the profile. But again, if you maybe only charge at initial sign up, or there are certain groups that you just feel you won't charge for if they join during the middle of the year, as opposed to at the start of the year, you can say that you don't want to charge for those changes. Next up, your sales tax on membership transaction. Your sales tax is added in the money tab. So this would be tax that you might be applying to merchandise if you're using our storefront as well. Next up, whether or not you want to enable member achievements. Member achievements are also a setup option. Uh, You can enable those and include those in the member profile and members are able to add in their own achievement listing. Um, So you can kind of think of it as just that exactly. It's going to be a short, quick few sentences of things the member has achieved. It's separate from their bio that's a part of their member directory. And there really isn't any sort of approval process. So this is definitely different from member attachments, which would be physical attachments to their profile. You might consider achievements as maybe a way for someone to create a very miniaturized version of perhaps a hobby resume or even a working resume on your site. So depending on the type of organization you have, that achievement list could be any number of things that your members might want to share with each other. And I believe I mentioned it, but achievements are also listed on the member directory listing as well. And whether or not your members can renew their membership early. Now, in your membership summary, you usually see a quick little um, note about when your membership is expiring and, (coughs) excuse me, when your membership is expiring. And if your membership is close to renewal, you'll see a little pop-up to let you know that your membership is up for renewal. I also see a pop-up saying that I have a payment due. But at the right-hand corner, I see this nice little note that my membership isn't due for renewal, but I can still renew early. So if you want your members to be able to just maybe get in quickly, renew their membership, maybe you have a lot of members who go out of the country for a year and they don't necessarily want to, maybe they're not around and they're not available when they need to renew their membership, they can go in and renew that early. So this only appears if you are allowing your members to be able to join or excuse me, renew their membership early outside of that renewal window. And so again, that is the last option that we'll see in the uh, the membership options in people options, whether or not your members can renew early. So this section controls the basic information that we're collecting about our primary member. Now, in individual memberships, this is the only member that you'd need to worry about. But if you're an organization that has group memberships, you also have to worry about the secondary and tertiary members. Now, with secondary members and tertiary members, there are, of course, differences. We did talk about them last week, and we've talked about them in many of our webinars. Very, very basically, the primary member is the member who is responsible for the membership. You can think of them as the person who is signing up, who is renewing, the person who is likely registering most of the other members for events. Your secondary and tertiary members are additional tacked on members. And the difference between the two of them, the secondary member will have a member profile on your site. Secondary member will have the ability to browse your site as a logged in member. That means they have access to member only content. They can register for member only events and so on and so forth. They are just like a primary member. The only difference is that they aren't able to renew the the entire group membership. So you can kind of think of them as the assistant to the regional manager of their membership. 
Now, with our secondary members, they can't renew the membership, but they can still peruse the site as a member. They can still manage their own separate member profile. It is connected to the primary member's profile, but they have their own contact information, their own achievements, their own answers to additional member data questions if you're collecting them. So there's a lot to keep in mind there. When you're thinking in terms of a family membership, secondary members would usually be the partner or spouse. Um, if you're thinking in terms of a business membership, they'd be the employees. Now, with our tertiary members, tertiary members are in your database as a member, but they do not have a member profile. So they would not be able to log into your site. They wouldn't be able to log in. They wouldn't be able to register themselves for member-only events, but the primary member in their membership is able to register them. So they would still have a, a few of the benefits of being a member. They can still be included on blast emailing communications, and they're also still able to be included on committee emails. Um, we're about to release a new tutorial for our committees module that goes through some of the updates and the changes. So if you're interested in that, um, within a couple of days, you can go ahead and check that out. So going back to our people options, secondary members and tertiary members, you're determining the exact same things, the level of information you want to collect from them, basic versus detailed info. We have some really helpful text that shows you what basic means and what detailed means. Basic name, email, birthday, gender, if you're collecting those items. Detailed info asks for the address, phone number, and work information. Now, the good news is that when you're adding in address information, we also have a sort of quick copy that you can use across the members in a group membership. So we can quickly copy the primary address from your primary member to secondary and tertiary members, which is great if they all live in the same household. Next up, if we are capturing email addresses, for your secondary and tertiary members. Now you'll see again in the purple text, if you selected detailed info, it's automatically going to collect the email address. But at the very bottom is where you determine if it's going to be required. So keep an eye on that one. We'll come back, we'll come to that in just a moment. If we're capturing genders and pronouns and the member relationship, so we have a uh, drop down list of relationship types that you can choose from to identify the relationship between secondary, tertiary, and primary members. Again, you don't have to collect it, it can be entirely optional, but if you're interested in really gathering more data about the types of people that join your organization, really invaluable there. And can secondary members be added outside the signup and renewal wizards and the same determination for tertiary members? Now, if we go back in time just a little bit and we're determining whether or not we're charging for changes through the profile, if you aren't allowing members to be able to add tertiary and secondary members outside the signup and renewal wizards anyways, you don't need to worry about uh for the most part, membership changes made through the profile. If you have additional items that people might purchase, that would be one thing. Of course, you might want them to pay for the name badge that they ordered. But if you're limiting your options so that members are only allowed to add additional people to their membership when they're renewing or when they're signing up for the first time, so whether that's annually or quarterly, however long your uh, membership durations are, then again, you can leave that selected as no, and they wouldn't be able to make those changes. So I'm going to go ahead and leave that selected as yes. Now, the last items before we take a little bit of a break and take a look at some of the info that we've collected are our miscellaneous options. The next member number, you don't usually need to worry about this. This is one of those definitely set it and forget it items. Um, if you have a listing of members that you provide us at the start of your relationship and your time with Club Express, we would then go in and put the next starting member number in for you. So if you come to us with 253 members, we start the next number at 254. If you're an organization that is pretty much located in just one state, um, so of course this wouldn't necessarily cover national organizations, but state organizations or organizations that are super local, you can choose your default member states so that will automatically select the state for all of your members. It's just one less thing they have to worry about. And then in 
our case, uh, you wouldn't have someone selecting Idaho instead of Illinois on accident. Now, next up, who are we notifying and when, if ever? Your membership director can receive different notifications depending on activity that you highlight as important for your organization to know about. Now, your membership director is definitely a real person in your organization, but unless you've told the system who that membership director is, those notifications can't go anywhere. So before we navigate back over to figuring out who our membership director is, I'll briefly go through the types of notifications you can receive. So you can receive nothing, not a single thing. If you, if your membership director is already drowning in emails, you may want to leave it as no notifications. If you're a large organization, especially if you have big, big membership drives and big renewal pushes. Getting a lot of emails can be a little bit daunting. Next up, after a new member signs up, but before they pay. So that would be during that sort of gray period where you have a member who has signed up, but they aren't an active member yet. They are still a prospective member or excuse me, they're still a uh, pending perspective. They would maybe need to be approved or they just haven't made a payment yet. So keep in mind, if, if that's a sweet spot for your organization, uh, for example, you know, you have that member sign up, maybe they kind of forgot about it. They lost steam a little bit. Maybe you're a volunteer organization and they signed up and then now they're thinking they don't have the time. That's the time that you got to get in there and give them that brand new member call. You got to reach out to them and you only know to do that if you've gotten an email. Next up, after payment for a new member. After a new member signs up, renews before payment, or only after new member sign up or renewal. So figure out which one works for your organization and then make sure that you actually can get those emails. So I'm going to save this because I did make a couple of changes and I want to pop into my club tab and your organization contacts are really added in two stages. And we have gone through this a lot and we have lots of different webinars and tutorials that discuss it. So I'm just gonna just dis uh, go through this very briefly. First thing would be making sure that the title exists. We do have a membership director, this looks great. And if we edit that person, we see that that person is identified as the club membership director. So. That right away lets us know that the title we have that says membership director is our membership director. We can label those titles anything that we'd like. I'll go back into my control panel. And now that I have my title, I want to pair that with a person. So it looks here like I already have my title paired with somebody. Charles Rizzo is the membership director being shown on the contacts page. And we're using the title's email address as opposed to Charles's uh, individual email address. So what that means is the system has recognized that Charles is in fact the membership director. So on whatever frequency I've selected those emails to go out, Charles is going to get them. Their system emails, their boilerplate emails. Now, uh, if we haven't gotten this question yet, um, you can only send out those emails to one membership director. And this actually covers all of the places on your website where you're choosing someone to receive notifications. So in the case of your membership director, only one person can get those notifications. You might be able to add 16 membership directors into your contacts page, but the system's only going to notify the first one that you added. Same with money options and notifying your treasurer when a payment is made. So keep in mind, again, you can only send those notifications to one person. If you do want to send them to multiple people, we highly recommend setting up a rule in Outlook or Gmail or whatever mail client you happen to be using. Next up, some various global contact information options. Are you warning if your email address is blank and requiring an email address for members and non-members? Now, we have pretty much fully transitioned into the digital age. Most people are likely communicating via email. Uh, you know, you have wonderful blast emailing built in, and it's certainly cheaper than sending out a newsletter. So if you want an email address for your members, you can certainly require it. It'll have a little red dot next to the field, and they won't be able to navigate through the rest of the membership signup wizard without filling in 
a valid email address. And then, of course, if you're requiring an email address for non-members. Now, for non-members, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, you may not necessarily have any communication with those non-members apart from uh, perhaps a blast email every month or every two months. So really making sure that if you are collecting information from non-members, whether that's in an event registration, a donation that's being made, or even for your mailing list, you want to make sure you're requiring that email address. You can also require a phone number and a mobile phone number. So uh, if you are collecting landline info still, or perhaps for businesses, you want to collect more than one phone number, you can certainly do that. If you're requiring a mobile number and in the event that you enable text messaging, it just makes it easier for members to opt into text messaging. Their number's already in their member profile. All they have to do is check a box to say that they'd like to enable text messaging. Now, beyond that are some additional membership options that pair with some of the things that we took a look at last week. When a member signs up with your organization and doesn't pay, they kind of hang out in your database as not a real member. They're not coming up in the active or expired list. You have to search for a separate status to find them, and their status only changes once they actually make a payment. You might have people who signed up because they were super excited about it and then just realized maybe they don't have time for this right now. Or you might have people who signed up, realized they forgot their wallet, ran downstairs, then the dog ran out, and now they don't know where they were. So you can warn members when some time has elapsed and they signed up, but they haven't quite completed payment. So if you have the number of days before a pending member is warned set at, let's say, 35, 35 days after they sign up, they'll get a quick little email, you know, hey, how's it going? We noticed that you haven't paid. Here's some more information. You can certainly make that a little bit shorter. Um, we see a lot of seven days or 10 days and days before a pending member is dropped. Now, this is different. So once they get that little warning email that says that they have a, you know, they have an outstanding balance, they haven't paid their membership dues, they're missing out on all of the great things that you offer, at some point, you'll want to likely remove them from your system. So you can drop that member or have the system drop that member automatically at that 40-day mark. Um, and at that point, they'll have a special status as a dropped member, noting that their fees were never paid. So you'll know right away if they ever want to reinstate themselves or reinstate their membership, that the only reason they were dropped previously was because they hadn't paid their initial fee. And then finally, if you are sending out a regular newsletter, if you're making the determination of who gets it by member type, or if members choose whether or not they want a newsletter, regardless of member type, every time they sign up. Now, that last section, again, those were our global selections that we were making. So once we've taken a look at all of our people options, again, some of these pair with some of the selections that we made last week for our member types. And some of these, I'll go ahead and save my changes because I did make a few. Some of them are really just going to be specific to the people, uh, excuse me, specific to your contact information and any reporting that you might want to run. Now, I want to pop into the people manager because I want to take a look at uh, some information or excuse me, um, I want to take a look at how some of the information is being displayed in what we've been collecting here. So on the left hand side, we are seeing for the most part a series of names, but every so often we do see that there's a name of the member which is not bolded, but what's instead bolded is the business name. Now, this is how information would appear, not when you're collecting necessarily business information, but this is a business membership. So remember how we kind of say that in the business membership, it's the business that's the membership. So this is what we mean when we say that. We are seeing the business name highlighted, but we still do see the individual's name there. Now, if I take a look at Audrey's profile and I select the edit option, and take a look at the basic member information. I can see my general information up at the top here. Here's my gender selection and pronoun selection. Again, those are both optional fields. Underneath that, I can put in my birthday and it's not required. I have my primary address 
And remember that we are allowing our members to enter in some additional address information. We have our secondary address that we can, with the click of a button, start using that address as our primary address, essentially. So remember, Snowbirds, students, that's going to be your bread and butter right there. Next up, other info. So this info is being pulled out from our primary info our primary contact info. Our other info includes our mobile number, any a website if we wanted to enter in a website, our email address. And underneath that, we have work information. So I am going to call this Audrey's Cupcakes, and we'll make her the founder. And I'll go ahead and save that information. Now, if we took, take a look a little bit further, here's our emergency contact information. This is optional, so we don't see those little red dots. I'll go ahead and save this. So now when we go back into our people manager, we made Audrey the founder of this cupcake business, but in the people manager, that's not something that we're actually seeing here. Now, if I take a look at Audrey's directory listing and I scroll down just a little bit because of Audrey's settings, her work information is actually going to appear in her directory listing. So we have Audrey's cupcakes, there's her work info and her work title. And this is all just on a uh, club where members are joining through their personal lives. Now I'm going to quickly go into Audrey's contact info. And because I'm an administrator, I can actually select the edit option on her directory listing and navigate quickly back to that contact info. And so then again, there's our work information. Now I'm going to take a quick little sidestep here. And I've switched tabs and I'm back on our Chicago Association of Financial Planners website. And I'm going to pop into our uh, people manager here. And I'll go ahead and I only want to search for active members. And now I want to make this a little bit bigger. I want to take a look at some differences that we're seeing here. Now we see that Everyone has a name, but in some cases, it is the business name still that's bolded. And in other cases, the business name is italicized or not bolded. And then we have the member name that's bolded instead. Now, remember that in this case, we are collecting information. We are collecting work information primarily, first and foremost. In our people options, this is a situation where we've denoted that members are joining through their professional lives. So in every case, the work information is front and center. Whether or not it's bolded is different. Bold means that it is a business membership, a membership you've configured as a business membership. Otherwise, if we take a look at, let's say, Su uh, Susan Adam in our individual membership, and we take a look at Susan's profile and select basic member information, at the very top, Here's our member information. Notice that it looks just a little bit different. So there are a few fields that would normally be included in additional uh, information at the bottom, which are now being added at the very top here. So we have our mailing name, or excuse me, our mobile phone number and our email address at the top. And we can still enter in our organization's information. Now let's go back into our Northwest Balloon Club. <clears throat> And I want to take a look at a couple of extra features here. In the member profile of Martin Smith, remember that Martin Smith has a family membership. I can double check that at the very top of my screen in my membership type summary. And on the right-hand side, I can see all of the additional members in my membership. Now, underneath here, I have this option for chapters and additional members. Now, this option is only here because I'm allowing for changes through the member profile. If I was only allowing administrators to make those changes, I'd only see it as an admin, but this is here allowing both the member and the administrator to make those changes. Now, many of you may have seen this screen before. This is what it would look like if you are adding in additional members for a very large group membership. So it looks like Martin has his brother, his wife, and his two children all on the same membership. And Martin has the ability to manage all of these right from his profile. He can add and manage chapters. And let's say I want to add a chapter for Mary Smith. I can edit Mary's contact information 
at the very bottom here, we can see here's our click here to copy emergency contact info from the primary member so I don't have to recreate the wheel. At the very top, I can click to copy my primary address info, again, not having to recreate the wheel here. And I can choose my relationship because I've added that in as an option. Now, when I select add chapter, I choose my chapter from the drop down list. I'll go ahead and select Chicago and save my changes. Now, if I scroll down, I am not being charged for those membership changes. If my chapter has a fee associated with it, I may not necessarily be charged for it. Or, of course, I can add in that fee, enforce payment through the profile, and make those changes whenever I'd like to. And you can see that in some cases, I have the ability to potentially add more than one chapter. So when we were taking a look at our member types last week, we looked at the option of being able to choose more than one chapter or only one chapter. In this case, at the top level, the primary member can add additional chapters, but secondary and tertiary members don't. Now, I'll go back into the control panel and I'll get us sort of geared up here for some questions. I uh, I suspect that we might have a few. Devin, how are we doing on those? We're doing pretty good. Um, <clears throat> let me look at a few. We answered a handful. Um, going back to the first one, let's see. Can you go over again the differences between uh, the different options for chapter admins receiving notifications about uh, when a member joins or edits what chapter they're in and, and when and when, when they would and would not receive those notifications? Yes. So right here, we have it highlighted, notify chapters on a membership change. If you have selected yes, it would be your chapter level administrators who would be getting those notifications. And you can set those up in the club tab under organization data. Now, remember that your tab might be labeled differently if your organization identifies more as an association or an organization or a league, um, but it is generally in the club tab where you are adjusting not just the fees for individual chapters, but also administrators. Now, you can have them notified every time someone joins the chapter. So even when I'm making selections through my member profile, if that's allowed, when I'm added to a chapter, that administrator would get an email, a system notification with my name as the member, letting them know that I've joined. Or once I've renewed, when I have confirmed my chapter selection, I would then get another separate email. And then of course, leaving that chapter, if I removed myself from that chapter, or if my membership expired, or if I was dropped as a member. Now, if the administrator performs, if the top level administrator performs any of those actions, the chapter level administrators aren't going to receive those notifications. So if Martin Smith went in and adjusted Audrey's chapter selection, no one would get a notification for that. Um, so it, it would be just changes made by the individual members that would create those notifications, not when an administrator performs that change. Um, and there was one more question, and this is one I'm actually, I was actually asking one of the support people about it, but is there a way to limit access to, um, for members adding their own secondaries? So is there a way to so, say like only admins are able to uh, add additional members? You know, I don't think that there is. So I know that the chapter selection has a separate, only administrators can make the chapter selection in the profile, but I don't think that there is the limitation. Perhaps in business memberships, I believe that there is a way to force only administrators being able to add in additional people. Um, but I don't know that there's a way to prevent primary members from being able to add those in the member profile. Yeah, I think that's just part of the way our configuration works. Um, that's something we have to, that would have to probably go through development. I don't think there's a way to limit it. The closest I could think of is you can take the option for additional members out of the sign up and renewal process by changing your sign up and renewal configuration. 
Um, but I think members would still be able to add additional members from their profile. So it wouldn't completely prevent them. Well, they might actually, now that you mentioned that, so if we, well, no, I guess you are right. I guess we could limit it to where um, they aren't allowed to add those outside of sign up and renewal and then also remove it from sign up. And oh renewal. yeah. Okay. So there would be two. Okay. Yeah, so it would be we kind just... of a two-step. We, we kind of walked our way backwards into it. Yeah. So if we say that in both cases, they can't add a secondary or a tertiary member outside of the renewal wizard. And then we pop into our new member sign up and we say, don't let them add in chapters or additional members. They wouldn't see that screen and we can save those changes. And now it well, And what I would actually do then as an administrator is go in and make those selections for them. So a little bit of a workaround, but it is something that you could do. Um, and of course, we always recommend testing it out, um, you know, maybe creating a test membership that you use just for purposes like this, where you can log in as a member and see, you know, Am I able to add in secondary members, even though I shouldn't be able to because of what I've set up? Um, this is one of those cases where it really helps to have that test member account. And then we had a couple questions. Someone did ask. It was a good question. It's something that I, I haven't thought about before. But if a, if a primary member is an administrator, do their secondaries and uh, also have administrator privilege? No. So that's a completely separate process. So you can even have it where... A secondary member can be an administrator and the primary not be an administrator. However, you want to set that up. That's not a usual, that's not usually a common setup because you want the administrator to have control over their own profile. But uh, there's no limitation on who is and who is not an administrator based on membership level. Obviously, tertiaries can't be administrators because they don't have a login, but uh, primary or secondary doesn't have an effect on administrator level. And there's no, um, there's no, like, if you're a part of a membership with an administrator, that doesn't inherently give you administrator access as well. That would be nice though. I mean, not really, but <laughs> <laughs> all of the benefits, um, yeah. but yeah, the only, the only limitations that come with being a secondary member are to what you can do inside your own membership. Yeah. But otherwise you should be totally open. And I think that's. I think that's about it for questions. All right. Well, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. We really appreciate it. Copy of this will be on our YouTube channel within a couple of days. Keep a lookout for our upcoming webinar calendar. We have a lot of really exciting things, potentially, dare I say it, a version announcement coming up soon. So we definitely want to keep an eye out on your inbox. Um, after the holidays, you know, we'll be getting ready to announce some exciting new things. And of course, we'll be resuming our regular regular webinar schedule. So like I said, keep an eye out on the calendar for that. Everyone have a wonderful weekend. And if you have any upcoming holiday plans, I hope that they include sunshine and relaxation. Goodbye, everyone.